What would you do if you were a referee at a soccer match and a demon showed up to play ball? And then we take a look at one of the more bizarre and honestly more unbelievable stories that I have personally experienced. Because today, I'm going to tell you about the time I went to hell. Today on Dead Rabbit Radio. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. I'm your host, Jason Carpenter. I'm having a great day. Hope you guys are having a great day too. Hope you guys are having lots of fun doing whatever you're doing. We got a ton of stuff to cover, so we're going to get started right away. First off, coming into Dead Rabbit Command right now is one of our newest Patreon supporters. Give it up, everyone on your feet for Daniels. Kuchiniskis. Woo! Everyone be give a big round of applause. He's kind of giving me a thumbs up. I, that was a pretty close pronunciation, I think. Daniels Kuchiniskis. He actually sent me a link. He sent me a link for a website that told me how to pronounce his name. I really appreciate that. Daniels, you're going to be our captain, our pilot this episode. You guys can't support the Patreon. I totally get it. Trust me. I totally get it. Just help spread the word about the show. That helps out so much. By letting people know about the show, you help the show grow. Daniels, let's go ahead and I'm going to give you the hair hang glider. We're going to jump off the highest point of Dead Rabbit Command. And we are going to glide all the way out to South Africa. Specifically, we're headed to Durban, South Africa. And we're there to watch a soccer match between the Orlando Pirates... They're a football club out of Johannesburg, and they're playing against the Amazulu team. They are, this is home field for them. They are actually the Durban team. So you have all these guys, like, getting ready for soccer. I don't know how you do that. Juggling balls, practicing their kicking, maybe running laps. (laughs) Like, Jason, all that stuff would make them super exhausted. They have to run back and forth playing soccer. Maybe they just, I don't know, lounge there and eat spaghetti for the carbs. But... Whatever they're do- whatever they are doing, they are doing right now. They're getting ready to play this soccer game. And these two teams are ready to rumble. It is time to start the game. So the referee comes out and he blows his whistle. And all the players are on their field. <laughs> their legs are all cramped. They're like, oh, why are we running all those laps right before the game? Uh, this is going to be totally sucky. And I don't know anything. <laughs> I don't know if I'm giving you any hints. I don't know anything about soccer. But apparently, apparently, one of the things they do before they start the game is the referee counts the players on each side. So he looks over at the Orlando Pirates. And you imagine that would be super chaotic, right? Because they're still running around. They're still moving and doing drills and things like that. Or do they line up? I don't know. I guess I'm going to research. I guess I'm going to research a little bit more. But the referee counts the Orlando Pirates. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Quit moving, quit moving. Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Okay, eleven Orlando Pirates are on this side. And then he turns to the Amazulu team. He's kind of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Twelve? You're not supposed to have twelve people on your team. It's... You get, don't these guys know how to play soccer? These are professional teams, too. This isn't like a little league, right? They have 12 players on their team. And the referee goes, you got you got to get rid of... You guys got too many players. And the Amazulu team is kind of looking around, and they have no idea what this referee is talking about. They clearly only have 11 people on the field. And the referee starts to get kind of upset because he's like, listen, I know how to count, and I'm counting to a 12. You, you guys are there, you, you do, do. He goes, look, look, that's the 12th guy. Look, look at the goal. Look at the goal over there. There's two goalies. You can't, have, you can't have two goalies. And everyone looks over, even the Orlando Pirates, they're trying to figure out what's going on at this point. Everyone's on the field. They look over. There's one goalie standing there. And they're like, ref, we don't know what you're talking about. It's the one goalie. It's the goalie that we always have. And the referee starts walking over there and he goes, well, who's this then? And he points at a dwarf. There's a dwarf on the field standing next to the goal. He's looking up at the referee and he goes, get out of here. You're you're a 12th player. I don't even think you're, you're not even wearing a jersey. What are you doing here? 
This story was actually told to us by a member of the Orlando Pirates who were who was here this day. His name is Innocent Mayo Oyo. Innocent Mayo Oyo. Legendary soccer player in South Africa. He's telling the story and he goes, we're standing on the field and this referee is yelling at a patch of grass. Get out of here, dude. You're not on the team. You can't have... <laughs> this is like your mascot or something, but he can't be on the field. And Innocent goes, we're watching this, and he's yelling at this patch of grass, and we figured out what was going on. Wasn't that the referee had lost his mind? The referee was in an argument with a tokoloshi. A tokoloshi, we did an episode on this guy a long time ago. These things are absolutely terrifying. It may be the size of a dwarf, but that's where like all of the connection to like helpful fairy lore ends. These guys are serial. <laughs> These creatures are serial killers. The episode we did was about a guy who wanted to become a powerful shaman. And to do that, he made a deal with a tokoloshi to just walk around the countryside murdering people. And it's that was a true crime story. That wasn't a fable. That was a true crime story. He blamed it on the Tokoloshi when he finally got caught. And when they executed him, people were worried that this guy had become so corrupted by being around the Tokoloshi and doing its bidding that he may now become a Tokoloshi himself. These things are to be feared. At the very least, they are a mischievous elf-like creature. But... You know, pull pranks, pulling down people's pants and stuff like that, putting sugar in your gas tank. They also, though, like I said, are also known for just straight up murdering people or convincing other people to do the murdering for them. Very, very vicious creatures. But there's a couple caveats, and I don't remember coming across this detail in the original episode, but they can be controlled by other people. The Togoloshi can actually, you can make a bargain with it like a genie. So the fact that it was on the playing field and it was working goal, it was going to work the goalie net with the Amazulu goalie, it's possible that one of the players had summoned this creature. It's also possible that these players were completely ignorant to what was going on. They were shocked. They were wondering why this referee was yelling at a patch of grass as well. And that someone maybe who had bet on the Amazulu team to beat the Orlando Pirates summoned the Tokoloshi to show up there to help fix the game. But what's interesting, so we have this mythological creature. How come only the referee can see it? Now, I don't remember coming across this detail in my Tokoloshi episode, but it was a long time ago. It was like a good six, seven hundred episodes ago, I think. The Togoloshi can turn invisible if it swallows a stone or if it drink, drinks water. That's within its power base. It can become invisible. But apparently, this is what Innocent was saying when he was doing this interview. He was being, inter he was being interviewed for about his career in sports. And this interview was in the SouthAfrican.com. This was a legitimate newspaper that published this article. He said, yeah, it was really weird. This referee was yelling at this patch of grass. And he was saying there was this tiny guy working the goal and none of us could see him. And Innocent goes, we realized it was a Tokoloshi. And the only, I don't remember this detail. This is fascinating. The only reason why the ref could see it and we couldn't, because when that invisibility spell is enacted, it only works against black people. And the referee, I, I, didn't, I didn't say this earlier. You're like, okay, okay, keep going. The referee was white. You're like, oh, okay, now that makes sense. The referee was white. And the players on both teams, they were all black. So the spell worked against them. They were This thing was completely invisible to them. But to the white referee, he could, he could clearly see a dwarf on the field. And the dwarf refused to leave. And the referee's yelling, and at this point, I think people are like, oh, dude, there might be like one of these invisible Togoloshi creatures here, and that's why he's seeing this, because he's white, and the spell doesn't work against white people. And the result of this thing, the referee ended the game. Technically, the game didn't even start yet, but the referee said, game's canceled, this player will not leave the field. And everyone's <laughs> like, what in the world is going on? There is no other player. But it turns out, that it was a Tokoloshi. According to Innocent, that story is actually true. Now, I wasn't able to go, <laughs> I wasn't able to go and look through the statistics of the teams and find out when they met up. There's no date to this story. So it could just be a funny story he's telling, right? But 
fascinating, right? Fascinating. And there's so many ways you can go with it. One, I do like the idea of someone not on the team summoning this extra goalie, but someone who has bet against the Orlando Pirates using black magic to fix the game. We did an episode a long time ago, is baseball an esoteric ritual? I'll put that episode in the show notes. And I think there is something to be said for people trying... So much money is riding on these games, right? That I think you could easily find people who are... People use lucky charms. People use lucky traditions to try to fix games. Are people actually using black magic to fix these games? Are they summoning demons so they win a bet? Is this more commonplace than we know? Are people actually using black magic to influence sporting events? And I think the answer, without, without doing any research, just off the top of my head, yeah, of course. Of course. People have lucky superstitions. Oh, I got to have my special underwear on before I watch the 49ers play, da, 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 all that stuff, right? So we're already casting these superstitions, using these spells, these rituals. You have to do the same thing to get ready, to get your team to win. Why not take the extra step and invoke dark spirits? But then also the idea of a creature, a cryptid, a demon, whatever it is, whose abilities only affect one ethnic group. And that opens up a whole other door of question. Maybe there is a subset of humans that only they can see Bigfoot. They have a genetic makeup in them that only they can see Bigfoot. And then there's a, other people who can only sense Bigfoot. And then there are people who they could be five feet away from Bigfoot would never know it because they just can't perceive it. And it's a genetic thing. Who knows? I mean, it's fascinating. I can't recall a time we've come across that before. A cryptid that only appears to people of a certain ethnic group. Now, the Togoloshi can appear in full, but once it casts its invisibility spell... It only works against black people? That's mind-boggling. Then it might explain why we have regional cryptids. We have cryptids that are really only spotted in certain areas. I think the idea has been, that I've always just considered, that region is most suitable for its habitat. Just like how you don't have Bengal tigers in downtown Milwaukee. It's because they're suited to be in the jungle. They're not walking around swamps. They're not walking around frigid mountains. You know what I'm saying? Like a black bear, you figure it's in the woods, not in the desert. That's where it evolved to exist. And so when you'd have cryptids, when you had something like Bigfoot, only in the Pacific Northwest, and then you have a version like the Yeti, high up in the mountains. That was the area where these creatures were. No. What if that's because the people of certain genetic makeups, they're the only ones who can see those cryptids? fascinating, fascinating theory. And I've never heard of this before. And and also just an interesting story. You're trying to play soccer. A monster shows up. What do you do? You can't keep the game going. They didn't even start the game, but you can't even start the game. Is it fair if, if one side has a serial killer dwarf who has black magic abilities, right? That's just full on not fair. And the ref just called the game. You would imagine, though, that people like... Other referees, <laughs> I'm sure that guy got fired, right? I doubt he was able to keep his job. And he was like, no, boss, believe me, there was a dwarf there that no, that no one else saw. And it argued with me. And I had to cancel the game because he wouldn't leave. And they're just like, you're fired. And he's like, well, I'll show you. He goes and he summons the Tokoloshi. Who do you want me to murder? Crazy, crazy story. I'll see if we can find more stuff like that. Yeah, what if there's just you, the only people who actually can see... Aliens or have encounters with aliens are genetically predisposed to that. In insane to even think about that. But while we are mind-boggled about that, Daniels, let's go ahead and toss you the keys to the Carpenter Copter. We're leaving behind Durban, South Africa. We're headed all the way out to Orangevale, California. <laughs> this story I'm about to tell you. I've only told one person this story, and I just told it to them two days ago. And the only reason I told them this story, it was my friend Sabine, the only reason I told her this story was in preparation for telling you this story. I have not repeated this story. I've told no one this story for 10 years. Not because it's weird, and it is, 
Not because it's unbelievable, and it is. Not because it's super not because it's super disgusting, and it is all of those things. The reason why I don't tell this story, I've had a lot of paranormal encounters happen to me. I've encountered demons, I've encountered ghosts, I've encountered shadow men, all sorts of phenomenon throughout my life. And I don't have any problem telling those stories. Why haven't I told this story for 10 years? Because there's a difference between all of those stories and the story I'm about to tell you. And I'm going to be upfront about it so you can take this story with a grain of salt. I believe something something happened. But the story I'm about to tell you is really the only paranormal story that I have where I was high when it happened. I started smoking in 1999. I was 21 years old. And I smoked and I drank heavily. I, I really drank on the weekends, but from 21 to 25, I smoked weed, I partied, I was sto- wake and bake. Like, I woke up stoned. And I would drink on the weekends, and I partied hard for about four years, and when I turned 25, I said, I don't want to do this anymore. I just gave it up. Gave up drinking, gave up smoking. From that point, from basically 25 till now, I drink maybe two or three times a year. Like, I'll drink on New Year's Eve. After I was done doing a play here in Hood River, like after we did a show, a show wrapped, I would drink. That's about it, right? Went from partying hard to giving it all up. But I, and I don't smoke weed anymore, but I did start smoking weed again in my mid 30s. So I was about 35, 36 years old. And I had no job at the time. No one was hiring. This was during the Great Recession. I was in California. There's nobody hiring. I didn't have a job. I was living at my grandma's house and I was stoned. I was stoned every day and it was, it was so awesome, right? It was totally dope. I'm living at my grandma's house. Her refrigerator was always full of the yummiest foods and she always had packed 12 can, twelve packs of soda. It was like unlimited amount of 12 packs of sodas in the other fridge in the garage. And it was me and my pit bull, Molly. I had this pit bull mix, Molly. And I slept in the backyard of my grandma's house. I had a recliner. Sacramento is the really one of the few cities you can do this in. Well, I'm sure there's a bunch of cities, but I would be... This is how I spent every day. I'd have this recliner that I had in the backyard of my grandma's house. And Molly would be sitting next to me. And I'd be on the computer and I'd be reading about conspiracy theories. Reading about UFOs. Reading about all this stuff. Until like four in the morning each night. And it was just such a... I mean, like the coldest it ever got was like 74. You put on you put on a sweater and I just sit out there and the sun would set and it'd be out in the night and I'd just be smoking, smoking weed and researching conspiracy theories. I did that for probably about two years in my grandma's house. It was great. I loved it. So I smoked heavily 21 to 25 and then I began smoking pretty heavily again, 34, 35 up to 36 and you go, Jason, that's fine. You know, you, you know, a lot of people smoke, right? So you're about to tell us a paranormal story that happened while you were high. Okay. But let me, I still don't think I've given you the scope of my highness. I didn't like the pipe, you know, the little uh, weed pipe they have. I never really liked a bong, too much work. That was, I was such a lazy stoner. I was like, ugh, I got to fill something with water. Uh, I didn't use a glass pipe. I didn't use any sort of pipe. So the way that I smoked my weed was I would take a Coca-Cola can and I would turn that into a pipe. And if you know anything about, if you know anything about the human body and about just chemistry in general... What I'm describing to you is the way that I smoked my weed for pretty much two years. My friends, I'd always be like, dude, dude, use, you should use my pipe. It hits way better. And they'd go, Jason, the reason why you're getting more high now is because you're smoking paint, dude. You're actually breathing in aluminum. They're like, I, I've had friends go, I will buy you a pipe, dude. Please, please, you're going to give yourself early onset Alzheimer's. What? No way, man. I would smoke out of a soda can. So you would punch little holes. You would crumple the can up and punch little holes in it. And you'd put the bud 
on the little holes, like a little gate there, and then you would shh, you would hold the... <laughs> you guys are like, yes, Jason, I've seen crack addicts smoke before. I know exactly what you're describing. As you're holding the flame over the nug, you're breathing it in. It hits better than a pipe. Now, is it because of the airflow and there's more smoke allowed to build up in the soda can versus a little pipe? Maybe that's why. Is it because I was possibly inhaling aluminum dust and paint? Maybe. But the point is, when I got high, I was in the stratosphere. I would get so stoned that every time I smoked using this method, and I smoked multiple <laughs> times a day for two years, I always felt, oh, dude, I, uh-oh, I'm stoned forever now. Like, I'll never be normal after this. <laughs> An hour later, I'm hitting it again. Oh, dude, what? Oh, man. But I smoked like that all the time. Again, my friends were going to have an intervention for me. People offered to buy me pipes. They go, this is dumb. Quit doing this. And the reason why I'm setting all of that up, because the story I'm about to tell you is, yes, it's super unbelievable, but I smoked like this constantly, 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 and I never had an experience like this before or afterwards. And that's why, to me, this story may have happened. But again, grain of salt. I wanted to be completely upfront with you guys. This is the only paranormal story I have where I'm stoned. And I wanted to be completely upfront with you guys. So you guys go, whoa. <laughs> Jason suffered brain damage that day. Here's the story. Absolutely. I've never told this story to the general public. And again, I never repeated the story until like two days ago. To get at least one person's view on it. I'm sitting there in my grandma's backyard. Beautiful. Giant Molly is next to me. And my grandma had like this brick planner that, not planner like a day planner, planter, you know, that you put flowers and stuff. She had like this brick, little brick seating area that kind of wrapped around her house. And then we had like a table in the backyard with some lawn furniture and stuff like that. I love, I love my grandma's house. They've passed away now and the house is in another person's hand and it looks beautiful. So I'm glad that another family is experiencing this beautiful piece of land. But at the time I'm sitting in the backyard in my grandma's house, I'm sitting on the brick planter. So I'm facing the lawn furniture. And I sit there and I put the can to my mouth and I flick that bick and get that flame coming out of that lighter. And as that smoke is rushing in to my lungs, I'm dropped into hell. And when I say dropped in, this is where all of the weirdness begins. When I say dropped into hell, what happened was I remember feeling myself physically being, it was almost as if a metal claw from a machine picked me up because the next thing I know, I actually fell maybe three inches into a chair. There was this empty chair and it wasn't like I slid there. It wasn't like I poofed there. I have a clear sensation of falling three inches into the chair. And I'm sitting in this chair throne type of thing. You know, it's a high back chair and it had like the high arm rests. And there, I'm sitting in front of a long black oval table. It's almost like I'm at, you know how you have like those long conference tables. I'm at one end of this table and it's this long, black, shiny table. And on each side of me, there are two chairs. So I'm sitting at the end of the table and now going lengthwise down the table, there's two chairs. And then at the head of the table, the opposite end of the table, there is another chair. And in all of these chairs are sitting demons. Now, what's so interesting about this? Again, was it because I was getting super high, smoking out of an aluminum can? Yes, right? That could definitely be the cause of all this. But what I thought was so weird about this is they were not demons how I had envisioned them. They didn't look like comic demons. They didn't look like cartoon demons, anything like that. 
They didn't even look like the demons you learn about in medieval texts where they're like, this demon has like the eagle head and the spider body and where's the kind? It wasn't like that. It wasn't how I would envision a demon. It wasn't the biblical depiction of a demon. It wasn't the medieval depiction of a demon. There were five humanoids sitting at this table. And the only way I could describe them is they were all about the size of a human. They were all probably around my height to a little bit over six feet tall. They weren't immensely tall or short. Their skin was tight on their bones, and they had a lot of protrusions. Their bones would come off in weird angles. It was symmetrical, though. So if you if one of them had... The one sitting at the end of the table was the one that I had the closest look at. I remember that his skin was very tight against his bones, his shoulders. His shoulders kind of popped out farther than the... Oh God, it's so hard to describe, so hard to describe an indescribable demon. It, it, it looked like this bony structure that someone had tightly put this flesh on it. Its face was very angular and wide, and its skin was aquamarine. And then there were two more of these creatures sitting on one side of me and sitting on the other side of me. And I realized instinctively, just like the story we covered yesterday, I realized instinctively I was in hell. I'm sitting in this chair, and there's demons on the side of the table. There's a demon in front of me, and the, the table's probably like a little over six feet long, maybe more like ten feet long. Behind the demon sitting at the head of the table, I there was like a, a not necessarily a window, but an entrance to a balcony. Because I could look past him, and I saw an archway. And then I saw where the balcony was and where it ended. And outside the balcony, I'm looking past now the balcony, all I can see is a massive red geological structure, some sort of huge wall that was a dark yet light red. The building I was in was, again, very ornate, very archway specific. I remember seeing these overhangs. You could see the ceiling and the wall and they, they had just kind of these intricate designs hanging down. Very symmetrical again, but not necessary. Like this place, I'm sure this place was up to code. All of the archways were decorative. Sitting in this chair at this table full of demons. And I realized, oh, dude, I'm in hell. What was weird, I had no fear there. I'm just sitting there. And the head demon looks at me, and he's opening his mouth to say something. And then the demon sitting to my right, the demon sitting closest to my right, his, he again had a very angular type of body. A lot of bone protrusions, really tight skin. But as this head demon's about to say something to me, I look over at this guy, this demon to my right, and his lower jaw to his neck begins to inflate. It now, from his chin to about the middle of his chest, he now looks like a bullfrog. He just has this giant... He's just like his skin is ballooning up. And... Now his face from the nose down takes these very frog-like features. And I look over at him, and he's just staring straight ahead. And his face goes... Bruh! And then he goes... Bruh! And he vomits all over the table in front of me. The vomit was this really, really thin liquid. It wasn't chunky. It wasn't Campbell's soup. I'm going to name all the foods you're eating right now. All the foods you have in your refrigerator. It wasn't Campbell's soup. It wasn't pizza rolls thickness. It was just this really thin slime that came out. All this bile that came out of them was this thin slime. But that's not what I was concerned about. <laughs> I would have been concerned just by that. But when he throws up, out comes all of this thin slime, this thin bile, and also 
about, I didn't count, so I'm going to estimate, but probably about 8 to 10 dicks and balls. He vomited up a bunch of penises and testicles, and they began, they began flooding the table. They were all this is so weird, right? This is so weird. And even in the moment, even when I was sitting there, I was like, ugh. They were all around the same shape and size. There was no there were none that were comically large or comically small. They're all around the same size. They were all attached not to each other. That would have been like the beholder from D D. You'd have a penis, and then the balls were attached to the penis still. But then they were clearly severed off there. And these balls and dicks are now kind of flowing through the bile on the table. And then they're stopping. They're just the momentum. The momentum that was carrying them. And actually, another thing about it, maybe, maybe it was six to eight. Maybe eight to ten is a little too much. But he throws up all of these dicks and balls on the table. I'm looking at these things, and I look up at the head demon, and now it's my turn to say something, right? I I look up at this head, I look at this guy throw these dicks and balls, I look at the dicks and balls, I look at the head demon, and I remember, I remember this, I remember this all so clearly, and this happened 10 years ago. I remember making a motion with my hand, like you're about to talk to someone, and I was about to say, what in the world, like, what is going on here? That was so disgusting to me. The fact that I was in hell, the fact that I was at a table with these demons, I turned to the head demon and I remember making a motion with my hand like I'm about to ask what in the world is going on. And then the next thing I know, I'm sitting back in my grandma's backyard in a different chair. I'm now sitting in one of the lawn chairs, staring out into the crystal blue Sacramento sky. Now, if that was the first time I ever got stoned smoking out of a soda can, I would have completely disregarded the story. It's just, this is what happens when you smoke aluminum. But I'd been doing this for years. You're like, Jason, that makes it more likely, dude. Brain damage is cumulative. Here's the thing, too, and I, I keep saying I was smoking aluminum. I do want to be clear, because actually there will be there will be links in the show notes about the harmful effects. I'm not recommended doing this, but I was smoking the bud. They said it's actually really, really hard to get the metal hot enough to smoke the paint and the aluminum. Uh, I was smoking the bud. On, I'm not, again, I'm not saying that it was safe by any means. But that if that was the first time I had smoked, I had had that experience... Or if it was the last time, like that, I did that, and I never smoked again because of that experience. I would say it was smoking out of the can that caused that. But I smoked long before that, and I continued to use the can way after that. Never, ever, ever, ever had an experience like that before. There was one time where I ate a bunch of weed. I was taking spoonfuls of Bammer, which is just cheap brown weed. I ate like $40, $50 worth of this cheap weed. And Bud Bundy crawled out of the television set when I was watching Married with Children. So I did, I have hallucinated before. But I've never had an experience where I was teleported to another place, where I'm moving around in this situation. Never. And never since either, because I did continue to smoke after that. I don't smoke anymore. But you can understand why I never told that story, right? And it's the same thing when I'm reading stuff online and when it starts off, well, me and my buddy were really stoned that night. I, I just really disregard anything that comes after that. And that's why I wanted to be up front with you guys as well. I didn't want to say at the ending, oh, by the way, <laughs> by the way, I was smoking weed off a soda can. I wanted to be very upfront about this. This is the only paranormal story I have while I'm high. What's super interesting is... This was a story I was really never going to tell anybody. One of the real reasons why I wanted to share that story with you today is because on yesterday's episode, we covered a story about a young man who believes that he went to hell. Now, it happened right before he went to sleep. Is it possible it was a dream? Sure. Is it possible that my experience... Skeptically speaking, and even I 
believe that a strong part of that experience was how I was smoking weed and the fact that I was smoking weed. I'll be totally honest with you. But yesterday when I read that, there's always been a part of my mind thinking, well, maybe that was real. Maybe that was real. Yesterday, I did an episode about a guy who went to hell. And there's similarities between the stories, which I thought was really weird. He, he wasn't a can-smoking drug user, but he said he appeared in a coliseum where there were these three demons there. And he felt like this conversation, this situation had been going on before he got there and his consciousness was simply dropped in to it. That his physical body was already there. And he is now joining the proceedings. And when I read that, I go, that's kind of how it felt for me. I didn't really know how to say it. I didn't really understand that part of the situation. But yeah, I felt like whatever was going on there, they weren't perturbed that I was there. I was supposed to be there. My subconsciousness was now joining a form there. That really kind of made me relook at my experience and go, maybe something did happen. And the quite, you know, the man, the young man yesterday, he's super disturbed by it. He doesn't know if he ever escaped from hell. For all he knows, he's still trapped in there. And it's interesting because I didn't get the implication, I didn't get the feeling that I was trapped in hell or I was sentenced to hell. I feel like, you know what? I, I, I can't even tell you. I don't know why I was there, but I didn't feel like I was trapped there or I was being punished or anything like that. I was there for some reason, but I, who knows why, right? I could, I, I almost said something and I go, Jason, you don't really think that that's not true. You could, you could go conspiracy cap all you want, but at the end of the day, you don't know why we, you were there. You didn't feel like you were in trouble. You didn't think you were sentenced to hell, but you were there and that demon was about to tell you something. And then the other dude threw up a bunch of dicks and balls. I remember being so repulsed by that. And I remember in the moment when I'm in hell and as I'm traveling back to earth, because even though it's a split second, I remember it is... Nothing's really a split second. When it happens, there is time. It's just too short for us to really measure. I remember as I'm in the moment and as I'm moving back into reality, how disgusted I was at the nature of that thing. Like it completely repulsed me. It was a very, very visceral reaction. I was disgusted by something that could just eat human genitalia. But yeah, that's it. That's it. It's a story that I don't tell because I was super stoned. And that obviously makes it most likely the reason why it happened was because I was super stoned. To me, it's interesting because I think even if it is drug induced, did the drugs allow me to push through some sort of space time thing? No, Jason, you're smoking paint. You're smoking paint. That's what was going on. I don't know. I love the story. I'm actually glad I could share it with you guys. And really, this shows to this 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 to me is a level of comfort with you guys, right? Like if I told this show, if I told this story earlier in the run of the show, you guys would be like, "What? What are we listening to?" But I think after so many episodes, I know you guys are just great. You guys are a great audience. And you guys know what to expect. And that's really to expect the unexpected. And I, yeah, I've never told the story publicly until a couple days ago. And other than one person, you now know this story about the time that I smoked weed off a soda can and went to hell. And came back after a guy vomited up human genitalia about a foot away from me. It's weird and unbelievable and disgusting. But whether or not it was caused by drugs or paint or I actually for a moment was in hell. I know something happened that day. Don't know what caused it, but the memories are real. The experience was real. I just don't know what caused it. And I don't know what it means.
deadrabbitradio at gmail.com is going to be our email address. You can also hit us up at facebook.com slash deadrabbitradio. TikTok is at deadrabbitradio. Dead Rabbit Radio is the daily paranormal conspiracy and true crime podcast. You don't have to listen to it every day, but I'm glad you listened to it today. Have a great one, guys. Peace.